Welcome to the All Out Leadership Podcast, hosted by Pastor Eric Lawson, where each episode is uniquely designed to help you live all out by bringing you practical leadership from a biblical perspective delivered in 10 minutes or less. So whether you're a business leader, serving in ministry, or simply looking to grow in your leadership, this podcast is for you. Before we dive into this week's topic, make sure to subscribe to the podcast and download the show notes at ericlawson.com forward slash podcast. And while you're at it, feel free to share the content on social media. Now, let's join Pastor Eric for this week's conversation. Welcome to another edition of the All Out Leadership Podcast. So glad you're joining us. We're continuing in the life of Absalom. And we just looked at uh, different things that Absalom did to steal the hearts of the people. And now I want to see a response from David when he starts to realize Absalom's throwing a coup. He's getting ready to take over the throne. People are rallying around Absalom. I want to bring out a very important leadership lesson from David's response. 2 Samuel 15, verse 13. Now, when a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom, so that David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart. Now, when you look at David's reaction, it seems to me that David was taken completely by surprise. Like this just blindsided him. Like, oh my gosh, where did this come from? And he's struck with fear and terror. You don't see a strategy at all in what he's doing in terms of his reaction. Now, it might have been the absolute best decision to flee, but it wasn't out of a strategy. It was out of a fear that was a knee-jerk reaction because he was taken by surprise. So here's my question. David, why were you so out of touch? David was out of touch that he had his son who was stealing the hearts of people. And not over just a day, over a period of months and maybe years, stealing the hearts of people. How was David caught off guard and totally out of touch? This is one of the greatest challenges that successful leaders have. We reach a certain point of success. We have a certain amount of financial stability and financial freedoms. Now we go to the lake a few more times. We get to take more vacations. You know, we work from home more because we don't have to go up to the office and deal with the stuff. And all of a sudden, over time, the success from hard work and sacrifice now ultimately puts us in a dangerous position where we begin to lose touch with the people that we're supposed to be leading. And as a result, David lost the pulse of the people, and he was blindsided by something he should have been well aware of, the storm that was brewing there. So as a leader, how do we keep a pulse as the organization grows and as it gets further and further from us? Uh, as pastors, as we launch more and more campuses and you know, campuses get a little bit further away from the central organization, uh, as you begin to create your franchise model and you begin to create you know, more stores or different employees, you got more branches. How do you keep a pulse on your organization, the culture? So here's just a couple things that help me. These aren't an all-encompassing list, and you probably have some great ideas, and I'd love to hear from you if you want to send me some. Uh, I read the emails that come to me. If somebody takes the time to put my name on an email, I'm going to read it. Now, I'll be honest. Uh, that, that hurts. There's just a lot of emails. They're just really painful. So if you're writing one, just be nice. If, if you're sending a compliment or, a, you know, a criticism, just please, you know, prayerfully write that a little more grace-filled sometimes. But I'm going to read it. And, and because I look for a kernel of truth in every complaint and every criticism, and I, I, I read them. Now, sometimes I'll just go, there. thank you for that, and put it in file cabinet chapter 11 uh, and just file that away. But there's a lot of times I learn a lot of important things. There's a lot of times I'll read an email and I'll go, you know, I need to go talk to some people. I need to go have a conversation. I'll pick up a phone call. There's times I've called people and said, I'd like to know more about this negative experience that you had. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. What can we do to fix it? What we can do to make it right? It really helps me keep the pulse on the organization. The second thing, as much as you can, walk among the people. It's very dangerous uh, when a leader no, never goes out among the staff, uh, never goes out among you know their customers anymore. Uh, stay connected to your people. Uh, as a pastor of a large church and multi-site, I still make priority to get out into the lobby as much as I can. I can't do it all the time, but I try to get out there, shake hands, meet people, uh, meet visitors, meet guests, meet people who've been part of our church, you know, forever, and and just talk and, and get a pulse and 
you know, listen to people. I hear a lot of things just walk in the lobby that I would have never heard, never known, never been made aware of had I not gotten out there with the people. Sam Walton was was the master of this. He, he was known for going out and hanging on the shipping docks at night and bringing them coffees and bringing them donuts and just hanging out with the people on the shipping docks because he wanted to know how certain things worked. Lee Iacocca, uh, when he took uh, Chrysler and turned it around for that brief period of time, um, he would go down and talk to people uh, down on the manufacturing floor because he just wanted to know, you tell me what you think. You know, when leaders just sit up in ivory towers and make decisions without talking with their teams and uh, the people that it impacts, we lose pulse. Uh, one thing for me that, that I, I really try to take advantage of is my lunches and coffee times. Uh, pretty much every week, there, you'll see there's several coffees and lunches on side of my calendar where I'm taking people uh, out from my staff. I'm taking people out from the church. Uh, and, or community leaders, and I'm just getting a pulse of, of, you know, what's going on. I would love to be able to take every church member out. I can't, uh, but I'll do for one what I wish I could do for all. Something else that has helped me is what's called skip level meetings, and that is going below my direct report. Uh, General Patton had a great philosophy. He goes, you command one level down, but you know what's going on in your team two levels down. You need a, a greater understanding of what's going on. So for me, I'll do what's called skip level lunches. Uh, I might meet with, you know, all my department heads and just have a lunch. There's times I'm just sitting in a room with all the staff, listening to all of them, uh, listening to their feedback, listening to, you know, they're, they're reporting on their you know OKRs, objectives by key results. And I'm just there to listen to of our team and, and just feel that I'm keeping a pulse. I'm not there every meeting, but I'm there enough to go, I feel like I have some pulse uh, if something's starting to drift from our mission. Uh, next, ask, who are your advisors? So my question to this is, David was out of touch, but it also seems the advisors were out of touch. So it tells me either, A, they came to David at some point and would try to tell him of these things, and they didn't, and David didn't listen, or B, they were out of touch, and they just didn't know to tell David. Either way, uh, David... Uh, needed a few better advisors around him because he was caught off guard and it seems that his team was caught off guard. So what qualifies uh, your advisors to be your advisors that are close to you? And one of the things that I look for in my team is, do you have a pulse? You know, who are you meeting with? Who are you talking to? What questions are you asking them? How are you staying abreast of the health of our church, our organization, our staff, our team? Um, here's a danger when you're picking people to advise you. Uh, don't pick people uh, that are like you or that you like. I'm going to say that again. What we tend to do is we go, hey, I like that guy. I like that lady. I want them on my team. We tend to pick people that are just like ourselves or we just like to be around. And it's not that you can't like your team. You should like your team, hopefully. Or I like certain things about you and I'm overlooking personality traits that rub me the wrong way because you had value because you got different perspective. You see things that in a way that just helps challenge the way I think. Be very careful who you're surrounding yourself with. Do they look just like you, talk just like you, think just like you? That not is probably not the best thing. Uh, and then here's a way to make sure people can push information up. So let's just say maybe David's advisors wanted to talk to David, but they were afraid to talk to David. This happens in many organizations because they didn't foster an atmosphere of honesty and trust that people get reprimanded when they question things. They get reprimanded when they challenge an idea. Look, what I want at Element Church and is part of what healthy organizations that I study is an atmosphere where people can challenge things in the right environment with the right people and in the right way to go, hey, help me understand that idea. Or, hey, could, could we challenge that policy? I don't know that that policy is working anymore. Or, hey, I don't think that's necessarily a good way that we spend money. Hey, I'm not sure that, you know, hey, have we thought about the consequences and ramification of this? We need to hear those things as a leader. But the way a leader responds when somebody questions or somebody challenges an idea uh, sets the tone as to whether or not it's a safe environment to ever challenge or question again in the future. So as a leader, watch how you react when somebody disagrees with you. Um, I get disagreed with all the time, and I think that is a great compliment to my leadership. I want an environment where somebody in, in, in my office can disagree with me behind the closed doors 
as leaders, they can challenge my idea. We can disagree about that. And I go, that's healthy. But if I go, who are you to disagree with me? Well, I'm the boss and I'm the man of God, the anointed for the hour. Who's to touch the Lord's anointed? If I were to have that kind of attitude, it would send the statement, don't challenge the pastor. You're going to get in trouble. I've never fired anybody. I've never even come close to firing anybody because they disagreed with me or challenged things in the right way and in the right environment and with the right people in the room. This has never happened. We invite that and celebrate that. In fact, that's one of the healthiest parts of, I think, our culture is we love to fight. <laughs> just a healthy word, just we have dialogue and discussion behind closed doors. It's fun. It's it's like a wrestling match, and it's great. And then we walk out, we're in agreement, and we can go, hey, awesome. We came out with a better idea than we all had when we came into this room. And that's part of a healthy. And then also this, remember, people repeat what you reward. So if you reward people who go, "Mm, mm, mm, that's the best idea ever. Oh, you reward people who never challenge you and always make you feel good. Well, then that's what you're going to going to continue to get a bunch of yes people. And that is a very dangerous place to be. I love Chinese dramas. I love learning about Chinese history and they really just make some great action movies. Plus I'm working on my Mandarin. So it's a way to practice my Mandarin. I can recognize every 250th word that they say. So I'm making progress, right? (laughs) So uh, there's this one I'm in, it's called the King's War and it's about the Qin dynasty, which was about 200 and something years before Christ and how they fell to the Han dynasty. And it's these whole conflicts and all these battles. Well, the last one of the last second to last emperor of Qin dynasty didn't want anybody to disagree with them and had everybody killed that made, made them feel uncomfortable. Somebody would come and tell them the truth, you know, off with their head. <laughs> and then he entrusted a really bad advisor who drew all the people, basically in Absalom, drew all the authority to himself. His name was Zhao Gao. And basically he uh, ended up having, he killed that emperor, turned on that emperor, and he never told that emperor any bad news. And watching this movie the whole time, it's just killing me as a leader because I'm just going, dude, don't you see it? You're violating every leadership principle on who you listen to, who you surround yourself with, and how you respond to things you don't like. And he just set an atmosphere that nobody could challenge him. And as a result, it cost him his life and it cost him the kingdom. Be very careful who you're listening to. See you next week. Thank you for joining us on the All Out Leadership Podcast. We hope you gained new biblical insight that challenged you to grow in your leadership. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we would love your help in getting the content out farther. You can help by subscribing to the podcast at ericlawson.com forward slash podcast and telling others about it. Next week, Pastor Eric will be back with another episode. So until then, we hope you have a great week being an all out leader.